months to figure out how to play. You dawdled and tried to bully the rest of the country. You lied to the athletes, jerked us all around, and expect us to believe you'll play in the spring. This conference is a joke. Here's Steve Dix. Indeed, and the joke is on all of us. I am Steve Dace. Aaron McIntyre is here. His voice has already been heard with that bit of snark, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't true. How are you, my friend? You know, I, you know, it's good in Gainesville right now. Actually, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't know because I'm not there, but I assume it is it's probably better there than it is in, you know, Iowa City or Minneapolis or Madison. Or Are you doing what Champaign I did with Sweden about a month Evanston ago where I went online and spent the day researching life in Sweden? East Lansing. Yeah. Are you doing that with SEC teams now? Ann Arbor, you know. Yeah. Gainesville or Tuscaloosa. <sighs> yeah, I think I'm going to, I think I'm a Florida Gators fan now. These, these are tough times, no doubt. And I think we should just begin by going through our big five here on Bigger Ten. Uh, the, the five takeaways from a conference that yesterday effed itself. Absolutely just face planted. I want to begin by setting the scene here, okay? The backdrop of, of where things currently stand, the state of the virus itself in the United States. This, this is data according to Worldometer and CDC, okay? And this is after two of the most populous regions in this country, the Sun Belt, and before that, the tri-state area, already had massive waves of the virus. And here we are. As we sit here today, August 12th is the date we're taping this, 0.014% of Americans are hospitalized with COVID symptoms. 0.014%. The, by the way, the, the national average right now for ER visits for COVID is 3.1% of all visits to the ER are for COVID. 0.7% of Americans right now are in active case. 0.7% in a nation of 331 million people. The median age of death for COVID is 78. Now, some of you have been asking, hey, where's all this excess death with the 160,000 COVID deaths that we weren't planning on back in the beginning of the year? Well, the median age of death for COVID is 78. That's the actual U.S. life expectancy, which means, sadly, that the one thing the models were right about is that COVID would primarily kill people that were largely going to die within a year Anyway, and we see that in the lack of excess death here in the United States. When you look at the overall numbers with this virus, I mean, look at this number down here. According to CDC, deaths don't register until we get to the 15 to 24 age group. Now, those are going to be when you play high school and pro and, and college football, 15 to 24. And even then, they're, they're just 0.2%, which means that... If you're in the 15 to 24, the age group that plays high school or college football in this country, your odds of recovering from coronavirus, even if you get it, are 99.98%. That's, that's what that means. I mean, people 54 and younger are 70% of the U.S. population, yet they're only 8% of the deaths. Well, Steve, there's things we don't know about this virus. Well, Think about the fact that we're never going to be more defenseless against this virus than we have been for the last six months. We're never going to know less than we have known for the last six months. We're never going to have fewer treatments for it than we have for the last six months. And after six months, that's the data. That's the, that's the worst the virus can do against our society when it blindsides us and it catches us off guard. That's the worst it's got. That's where we stand. As a country, you're hearing, well, if we'd have taken this seriously, I mean, how do you do oh, much better than 0.014%? How do you do much better than that? How do you do much better than that? So why is anything closed or canceled 
And I don't want to hear about the, 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 the heart inflammation. That is associated with literally every virus outbreak of everything. And the SEC has already been testing for this for the last five months. And, and tell okay. me, at, at what point in the future is the heart inflammation not going? Are we just going to shut down all athletic right, right. events ever for the rest of time? That, that's what you're saying. Right. And because we, I, like you just said, this heart inflammation thing, that's not new to this virus. No, it's not new to any virus. And if that were the issue, don't you think they would have just said so in their official statements yesterday? But they didn't. Which brings us to point number two here. I think one of the driving figures in this is the University of Michigan school president, Mark Schlissel. Mark Schlissel is the first physician to be president at the University of Michigan. He's one of the most decora decorated immunologists in America, comes from Brown University and Johns Hopkins. And what I'm trying to figure out is he's had his student athletes, not just in football, but every fall sport. And, and all the winter sports have been training too, actually. Basketball, all of them. They've all been on campus for the last two months. And yet this guy never went and spoke to his athletes one time. Tyler Cochran, whose father, Brad, was an All-American at Michigan in the 1980s. He's a player on this year's football team, graduating uh, this year. Academic All-Big Ten. And he's a walk-on, so he's paying his way to come here and play football. And he spoke to the Michigan Daily yesterday and said that Mark Schlissel, Michigan school president, never visited the practice facility one time to make sure that it was safe, never spoke to the players one time for two months. He's an immunologist. We're in a pandemic. And he never once came to find out, hey, are these kids safe? What, are, what practices are we doing here? What does it look like? How in the world can you possibly explain that? Yesterday, Wake Forest uh, school president, another school with a great med school, went and visited the football team. I saw Tennessee's chancellor did the same thing yesterday. Not one time. What kind of a doctor in the middle of a pandemic, if these kids are so vulnerable, brings them back to work out for two months and then never bothers to check in with them at all for two whole months? How in the world do you explain that other than just the worst kind of elitism? And yet, he and others made decisions that will impact the rest of their lives, not to mention a lot of livelihoods around the Big Ten footprint. And Aaron, when you look at all of the med schools we have in this league, and yet they provided no specifics whatsoever on what new medical concerns emerged from just a week ago when they announced a schedule and then a week later canceled the season. This reeks of the snide condescension that you would expect from, I don't know, the Ivy League, which, by the way, remember when they announced that they were canceling football, which I said when they canceled their conference tournament in basketball earlier this year, if an Ivy League cancels its tournament in the middle of the forest, does anybody even know? Does anybody care? Uh, Bueller? The answer is, of course, no. They are a non... I mean, it's fun to watch sometimes. It's fun to watch those little... Beyond just the, the novel, the novelty of Ivy League athletics, they don't matter. They don't matter. But they put out some sort of snide comment about how they don't. What was their comment? Uh, they don't we, rely. Yeah, we, are, we don't rely on our athletes, on our athletes, to, athletes to fund our athletic programs. No, you can charge people sixty thousand exactly. dollars a year for online classes. Yeah, this type exactly. of the way that this is handled, the way that they viewed the athletes as the little people, as the pawns, they the way they viewed us. Quite frankly, out here, the ones who actually do the. Uh, living and dying around here, who actually, for the most part, aside from the boosters, pay the bills by going to the games and watching these things on the televisions. And yes, we actually pay the bill by watching them on television because we also watch the commercials, eyeballs on commercials. So yes, in that way, we are paying and doing the living and dying over here. The, the way they've treated these athletes, quite frankly, with contempt and us with contempt, reeks of something you would expect from a stereotype of so, one of the worst stereotypes of the Ivy League. The snide elitist condescension. Yeah, that's exactly what we got here. Outside of a few schools in the Big Ten, Steve, I'm not sure, like, Iowa was one of the schools 
where it sounded like Bruce Harold, that's Iowa's president, Iowa's university president, as well as athletic director Gary Barter. And I've been, and hell, he's deserved it. I've been extru extraordinarily hard on him. But at least he was lobbying for something resembling sanity, while the rest of the Big Ten presidents, Schlissel included, seem to have absolutely not a damn care for these athletes or for the residual effects, the billions of dollars that will be lost in revenue, ancillary revenue, to the local communities and economies around and surrounding these sports. It's just, it reeks, it just reeks of elitism. Absolutely, 100% reeks of elitism. We don't need to tell you who the vote was, how the vote went, votes went. We, we've heard a few trickles and leaks about how or who voted how. Um, but beyond that, this is just, it, it's an outrage. It really is. Football should be, football should be a pastime. Football should be something that we escape to. But when it's something like this, it becomes bigger than that. If they just would have treated everyone in the equation like adults, then I'm, we'd be disappointed. We might be angry, but we're having a different conversation than we are right now. They treated us less than adults. They didn't even treat us like children. They treated us, all of us, the athletes foremost, with contempt. And that just cannot be tolerated. Well said. So we had statements yesterday. We had a ridiculous interview Kevin Warren gave to the Big Ten Network. And props to Dave Revson uh, for, you know, it's tough to do that when you're broadcasting on the hometown channel. But I thought he really pushed Kevin Warren, the new commissioner, uh, who should be soon the former commissioner, uh, pushed him for some answers that were not forthcoming. And after listening to this, and I listened to the Pac-12 press conference as well, maybe they've got some answers and there weren't any. All I was left with questions, Aaron. I'd like to kind of run some of those questions down for our audience that you would think we'd have answers to these today, but we don't. For example, why is it safe for thousands of students to be on campus, but not for a hundred football players to be on campus, given that they have more structure and better health care than all of those students? What, what sense does that make? None. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. All right, let, let's see if this next question, maybe we can come up with something to answer this next one. How come you can't accept the liability for a hundred football players? But you can accept the liability for thousands of students on campus paying you exorbitant room and board fees. Or maybe the question answers itself, perhaps, do you think? Maybe. Maybe that's, maybe the question is asked and answered there, Your Honor. Next question. Is Commissioner Kevin Warren's son, is he still practicing down at Mississippi State? They're practicing in the SEC right now. Is he still practicing there? I would imagine so. I, I would I, assume so. Yeah. I, he hasn't pulled him, yanked him. It's not safe, son. Our Big Ten medical experts told me so. It's not safe. Get out of that renegade SEC. They don't care about you. Plus, they're a bunch of racists down south there anyway. They don't care about people like you. Get out. Really? So, okay, for the uh, the progeny warned to go to football practice today down there in Mississippi, where they just got rid of the Confederate flag 10 minutes ago, he can go down there and practice right now. But it ain't safe to, 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 to get ready for a football season here in the Big Ten footprint. Weird, because, I mean, all these people are telling me how just much worse they're doing with the virus and stuff down there, too. Yeah. Hmm. Weird how his son can go to practice today, though. That's kind of odd. Next question I have that I think we could maybe get an answer to. Why did Ke Commissioner Kevin Warren tell us the Big Ten's protocols were safe for his own son to play and then advocate for moving the, the season to the spring 48 hours later? Can you riddle me that one, Batman? Do you know the answer to that one, Aaron? No, no. Hey, I just got a completely random aside here that's breaking as we're taping this. Would you like to hear this random yeah, I'd aside? I'd love to. Why not? You bet. Uh, Tom Pelissero. You know that name? He's a reporter for the NFL Network. Yeah. Original deal. Quote, tweet here. Original deal between the NFL and NFLPA called for an extension of daily testing for any club exceeding a 5% positivity rate through two weeks. So far, the league says no club is over 2%. So there's that, and they have less of a bubble than uh, they have less of a bubble than the, these college programs. Jim Harbaugh reported that Michigan's had 353 consecutive negative tests in the football program. Yeah, so there's 353 consecutive negatives. Yeah, not safe, Steve. Steve. Yeah, heart condition, long-term effects. Yeah, long-term. How many days till the election? I'm sorry. Uh, let's get to the next question. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Next question. Um. 
What the hell was that dog and pony show schedule release last week? You know, I actually do have an answer for this one. Just milk three hours of commercial inventory yeah. on the Big Ten Network before you knew you were going to shut it down, maybe? Yeah. Uh, the answer is it, it was a dog and pony show. <laughs> There you go. Another one asked and answered. There you go. All right. So let me try this question. See if this one's maybe a little brighter. How come these presidents didn't meet with their student athletes before canceling them? Is that that too much to ask? Apparently, hmm. apparently, because you know we're, we're we're the Big Ten. We're morally pure um, up here, not like they are down south, and. Um, you know, we are care about our student athletes up here. They're not commodities to us like they are down there. Yeah. And yet you had them on your campuses for two damn months and you couldn't go, you couldn't meet with them, couldn't talk to them, hmm. couldn't find out what was going on, whether they felt safe. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they had concerns. Maybe you wanted to hear that. Nothing. Nothing. But we are going to cancel your season on you. Yeah. It's funny. Um, it's also funny. I, I'm sure it's just winky dink and i'm sure i'm just reading the tea leaves wrong it's it's funny here how it appears the the presidents at the big 10 and and the elitists calling the shots here just expect um free labor like indentured servitude it's odd it's it is odd if you, if you, i'm sure that's i'm not sure the case. i'm sure it's I'm a sure random occurrence that the two conferences who had players unite huh. to take steps towards yeah. organization are the two conferences that canceled their seasons already I mean that's an that's an awfully eerie coincidence. Nah. No. Nah. No. Quinky dink, do. Steve. Yeah. Quinky yeah. dink. Random. You bet. You bet. All right, next question we have. Um, what new medical information did the Big Ten receive and why didn't they share it with their student athletes and the public? In fact, you've had the commissioner of the SEC and the ACC both say, Hey, we Actually, and now the Big 12. I saw Bob Bowlesby said this this morning too. Hey, uh, we we'd love to know what what did the Big Ten hear? Because our medical experts are not telling us what, what what they're concerned about. One of the Big Ten's medical experts, I saw a clip of her on CNN. She also from the University of Michigan. And all she said was, there's too many risks and variables. And so we thought we should just press pause on fall sports. You know, like back in March, we could just press pause on an economy and be shocked then when we find out that there's 40 million unemployed. The New York Times is writing about the spike in suicides and depression in America and drug use. Yeah, yeah. Why do you hate, why do you hate old people? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I, you know, I, apparently we don't care enough up here for our presidents to go meet with our own kids. And now we don't care about the Southern kids either that are still trying to get a season on. I mean, I, I would think if you've got all this new late break in medical information that they're endangering the lives of their student athletes down yes. there in the SEC, yeah. ACC, and Pac-12, I, I, I kind of think maybe you have a moral obligation to share what that information might be. Don't you think, Aaron? Maybe just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. I mean, Kevin Warren's son is playing in the SEC right I mean, now and apparently has not been privy to this new information yeah. that the Big Ten didn't know last week when it released a schedule. I can't believe that Kevin Warren is not yanking his son out of, conf out of, out of practice in the SEC right now because they're ignoring this new late-breaking medical information that the Big Ten apparently has. Just to underscore your, 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 your point here, Steve, even if it's just the, the, the littlest tidbit of information, if it just saves one life. It just saves one life, yeah. It just saves one life. Thank you. All right, let's get to the next question. Was that the last one? No, oh, we have this one. Last one here. This is the last one. If the league is serious about playing in the spring, how come it unveiled no contingencies for making that happen whatsoever? It's an enigma wrapped inside a mystery, wrapped inside a burrito. <laughs> Ryan Day, the Ohio State coach today, all of us. Ryan Day today. His press conference today, dude, is just freaking livid. And I believe Andy Staples at The Athletic... Uh, noted uh, tinges of disgust uh, in, in Ryan Day's voice that not a damn bit of direction has come from the Big Ten for playing in the spring. You know why? Because they're not going to play in the spring, guys. Because they're not. That's a lie, too. This whole thing's been a lie, guys. They never intended to play. I completely agree uh, with Joshua Bynum, impressive young man, linebacker at Ohio State, who's on the Big Ten Network. I listened to an interview with him this morning. The whole thing was a charade. They never intended to play. And I think what went on here is they 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 when they, they thought when they cut the conference schedule first, the rest of college football would go along, and it, it didn't immediately. And they kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. 
And then on the, over the weekend, I think they scrambled to get every conference in college football to agree with them to cancel. They couldn't. So then they had to go ahead and their hand was called. The bluff was called. They didn't want the players to go into padded practice the very next week. And that's why they canceled it during the timing that they had. And then when they were forced to show, show your hand. What medical information? How do you one week release a schedule and the next week cancel everything? What changed? What medical information do you have? They came back with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I don't believe they ever intended to play. So what's the consequence of that? You know, there's a great article that was done recently uh, on the uh, Rivals.com site that covers the University of Illinois. I want to run down this thread. This thread is incredible on this article. It starts off by pointing out Illinois has the second highest public university athletic department debt in the country, with Michigan, Minnesota, and Ohio State also in the top 10. Among public universities, Illinois ranks second in the nation with $325 million in athletic department debt just to service that debt every year. Okay, just to service the debt. Doesn't mean you're paying it down. Just to service the debt is $20 million. Folks, that's almost one, half of the money that Illinois gets from the Big Ten's television revenue share every year. And that just goes to pay on the servicing of its debt. Michigan. With all of its vaunted alumni network, donor network, second or third most lucrative college sports program in the country, ranks fourth among public school athletic departments with $300 million in debt, followed by Minnesota, fifth at $252 million, and Ohio State, the most lucrative athletic department in the country, $250 million in public school athletic department debt. Wow. Another quote from the article, we have $13 million in scholarships we fund for over 500 student athletes in 21 sports. They're getting a world-class education, a life-changing experience because of what we do. All would be toast if no football. We have 300 employees in our athletics department that rely on us to help pay their rent or their mortgage, to put food on their table, to provide them with financial stability or security insurance. Those jobs could all be toast. Barry Alvarez at Wisconsin's already talking about layoffs, by the way. We have a local economy here that relies on us to keep hotels open, restaurants, gas stations, retail establishments. And we give them the opportunity to provide our community members with jobs and disposable income. Those are all taking a massive hit now without football. Those are other families in the private sector. Food taken off of their table as well. Maybe it was the right decision. Maybe it was. And maybe when they get ready to go to padded practices down south, they're going to say, eh, our, suddenly our medical experts aren't as giddy. Who knows? We'll see that play out over the next few weeks. But don't you think you'd like to know the answer to those questions? Don't you think, given what we just laid out is at stake here, the lives and livelihoods that are at stake here, don't you think we just needed more answers than, here's our schedule, and now we're not playing? And we can't tell you why, it's just not safe. So what's next? Here's the thing, Aaron. I, I don't think we know what's next. Um, on next week's episode, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, but, but frankly, it kind of comes down to one question. Do these other conferences pull off a season or not? If they do, Something wicked this way comes if you're a Big Ten football fan. You have SMU'd yourself. This is, a, this is like relegation in soccer. And we may competitively, we may not recover competitively for a generation from this. If the other conferences can't pull off a season, there are still those dramatic financial consequences. But competitively, it's not uh, the Chernobyl event that it would be if we knifed ourselves while others can play. So... We kind of have to know the answer to that first. Your thoughts? I put in the caption, the description for, for this topic on the bigger five, or the big five, I should say, Red Horizon. Regardless of what happens next, the sun's either going down or it's about to come up. The, the horizon is red either way. Either the sun's about to go down on this conference for a long time, a generation, we're not going to see the sun for a long time. It's going to be a dark, cold night full of terrors. Yeah, I think that's a line from uh, Game of Thrones or something. Mm -hmm. Or 
If those other con uh, conferences can't pull off a season, um, the sun's coming up, but it's coming up on a completely new day of collegiate athletics, one way or the other. Because right now, what these conferences have, have learned, and unwittingly, funny enough, unwittingly, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 perpetuated and actually sped up the process of a potential unionization. No doubt. A place. No doubt. Their a, fear across, of this uh, guaranteed it, ensured yes, this is going to happen and, now. Ensured it and sped yep. up the timeline for this happening. Because you saw, even in the Big Ten, there were still tons from, from the biggest players in the entire country. Tons of goodwill, so to speak, about wanting to play. We just want to play the season. Because these guys still need this platform in order to showcase their talents if they want to have any shot at the next level. But now you're going to take that opportunity away from them? willy-nilly after jerking them around for five months? Hell yeah, this is going to speed up that process. So either the other conferences, ACC, SEC, Big 12, and even some of those group of five conferences, it sounds like some of those are still planning and maybe going to be able to play. If, if I were a group of five conference right now, MAC, Mountain West, you've already canceled, there's got to be some TV money there somewhere. I, I would stay in uh, until you're the last polar bear on the, uh, on the iceberg. Or on the you know on the ice chunk, try to try to stay in as long as you can. But if some of those other leagues continue to play, I, I would even I would even go as far as to say the chances of the Big Ten coming back in any sport go down. Now I'm not saying that's a zero percent chance. I'm saying it's like an eighty to seventy percent chance. You know it's probably whatever it, whatever it is. The the ice age that is coming for your conference if you don't figure this out very quickly and the other conferences do good lord this is by far and guys i i know a lot of you listening and watching this probably come from different bents than steve and i do and so this is really saying something what i'm about to say this might be the most psychotic thing to come out of the american university setting in its history because all of the tentacles that football touches all of the opportunities lost for all of the reasons that we've talked about on this podcast and others for the last five months, all of those scholarships gone, all of those opportunities gone. How do you replace that? You can't just press play again. You press pause on the VCR. You come back, you start it again. You try to press pause on this. You come back and there's a freaking nuclear crater in the ground if you press pause on this, which is what the Big Ten is attempting to do. We could all be wrong about this, though, Steve. We could be completely wrong. But that's wishful thinking at this point. Come back and play our weekly game of Big Ten Would You Rather next. Bigger Ten is brought to you by Michigan Podcast. If you like what you're hearing today and would like to support us, Head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast, where if you live somewhere where sports wagering is illegal, you can find Steve's picks for various games for just $5 a month in the process. You can say thank you for creating this podcast on YouTube or via podcast wherever you listen. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. All right, let's get to it. It's our weekly game of Would You Rather here on Bigger 10. And Aaron, you get to go first. You know, I've been sitting here thinking uh, what's going to happen to those uh, Corona bros in the media who successfully got their fear porn peddled uh, to at least get a good segment of college football canceled and maybe the whole season. If you were them, would, would you rather uh, have to learn to code or try monetizing the amateur porn from your mom's basement? If you're a Corona bro in the media that successfully got the sport canceled, thus costing you your own job as well, which of those two routes would you rather go down uh, in order to, uh, to to have to make a living now, Aaron? Well, um, if, if I put myself in the shoes of a Corona bro, I would stick with what I'm good at, and I would go ahead and try to monetize some uh some amateur pr porn because you've already been doing you're you're already a panic porn star huh you're just doing a different genre of porn this time i like it so, just a different evolution yeah I like don't it. don't try you know if if you're the beatles 
Don't try progressive rock at the end of your career. Stick with what you're good at and never do anything you're good at for free. Right. So that's that's what I would try to do if I were a Corona bro. bro you're already a, a panic porn star. Stick with the porn and, genre. And, and no doubt. And um, plus, it's always good to evolve as an artist. That's uh, true as well. And this yeah. is this is already their genre. Good yeah. point. All right. This one's for you. Would you it's just, I, it's just completely a random question? Would you rather be a fan of Arkansas or Wake Forest? <sighs> Man. Not that we're going to have to be entertaining the questions like this anytime <laughs> soon. Just just totally random. I mean, Wake Forest is a better football program right now. I, I, Arkansas historically is 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 a top 25, 30 program in the history of the sport. Um although that North Carolina area is nice. Uh but I guess if I had my choice, I'd rather be in the SEC. Uh so because apparently it turns out it does mean more. So I'm going to go with Arkansas. Uh, okay. Uh, this next one's from you. Would you rather be a college football player sent home where you're going to get worse health care and you're more likely to get the virus if the season were to be canceled or a non-revenue sport athlete hoping your scholarship is still there after the season is canceled? Which of those two F's would you rather be F'd, Aaron? Um, Furthermore, I'm do you trying, think the I'm presidents trying. asked these qu these questions of themselves at all as they were deliberating these decisions? Do you think? You know, oh. huh. okay. Well, okay. Here's here's my answer: non revenue sport athlete. Because if you're an, in an Olympic sport, aren't you allowed to capitalize on your nil? No, you're not. It's not not you're if still it's, not still not because you're an NCAA. And say regulated sport, yes. Okay, well, um, I, I'd rather go with. I'd rather be a college football player then, because I think there's still a greater chance of your scholarship coming back someday than there is uh, there is a non revenue sport. The other way of looking at this is, given the numbers, would you take your chances with coronavirus or your scholarship? I'd rather take my chances with, with coronavirus. coronavirus. Yeah. yeah, and and know that my scholarship was there when I you know had the ninety nine point nine eight percent odds of recovering. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Uh, this final one is for you. Again, just complete hypothetical uh, here. Hypothetically speaking, if you were working security detail for certain Big Ten member institution presidents, would you rather carry an <laughs> AR-15 or a handgun? <laughs> oh, right about now, Ohio State's new president is like, I'm so glad I don't start in this job for another month. So <laughs> none of this gets on me. Um it kind of comes, you know, you're, the AR-15 is obviously fairly well stigmatized, you know? So I guess I would go, I guess I'd go with the handgun. You're going for the subtle? Yeah, I'm going to go with more more subtlety. Although, I mean, if you if you really just want to make the whole exercise a giant F, you, then you go with the AR-15 and say how you like them apples, right? But I'm, I'm probably going to go with the handgun. Yeah, I that like makes that. makes sense. Obviously, you guys can tell we're not bitter at all. More in a moment. This week's Twitter poll results are a tad one-sided. Do you believe there will be spring football in the Big Ten? Now, I asked this question um, this morning, and I watched it in real time to see how long it was going to take to get a yes. The first 149 votes were all no's, and even in five hours, that's how long we left this poll up there, only 5.1% of you. And Katrina and the Waves, I'm going to be walking on some of that sunshine. I mean, if you think the Big Ten's playing football in the spring, brother or sister, yeah, pass some of that. Puff, puff, pass, man. <laughs> puff, puff, pass. I could use a hit of that uh. right about now. All right? The other 95% of you don't believe babies come from storks anymore, and you live in a place we call real. Uh, let's get I, to... Go I, ahead. I, I, I would just want to say the 5.1% of you who voted yes... Uh, you need to be in a padded room. That's all. Or, man, you're just really, really idealistic. Right? There you go. Yeah, that, that too. All right, let's get to this week's question of the week, which is more of a statement from Unsportsmanlike Conduct. He says, player safety concerns with playing two schedules within nine months and eligibility awkwardness with early enrollees and wanting to be drafted brought to you by the same guys who pushed out a schedule or the same commissioner who pushed out a schedule knowing he had no intention of ever using it. It feels like it is over because it, you know why it feels that way? 
Like when you get punched in the nuts, it feels like that really hurt. You know why? Because it hurt. <laughs> you know why it feels like it's over? Because it is. And now we're in a difficult position as fans, Aaron. Yep. Because we really want to see college football this fall, right? We want to watch it. On the other hand, we have to recognize that if we do, it will be, um, uh, it'll, it'll, maybe not a death blow, but certainly a serious wound to our teams in our favorite conference. So we're kind of, yep. we're kind of torn now, right? Yes. Part of me, though, we saw maybe not a day like this coming, but we knew, we knew at some point. If, if there were no concessions from the NCAA or these universities as a whole in terms of how they allow athletes to actually act like athletes and capitalize on their God-given talents that they've honed and developed for years and years and years and count, put in countless hours in, even not even giving them name, image, image, and likeness, if there were no concessions like that, we were going to head for a day similar to what we have right now, though not in the same, the same way that we are right now. Here's the thing. I really hope, though, that the laws of economics and markets are actually enforced here. They do eventually. They enforce themselves eventually, but I hope they enforce themselves here. And I hope it is an example for others to realize we're giving you a platform. We kind of made a deal with you, the athlete, that you'd get an education, you'd be treated like kings, you'd get all of the nutrition, all of the training, and you'd have, like I said, this invaluable platform to showcase your talents and abilities in the marketplace so that maybe you'll have a shot at the next level to capitalize even further on your talents. And we're just going to take that away from you and you have no say about it. I, I hope a lesson is learned that in this country, you can't roll like that. You can't roll like that, Steve. A month ago, these universities were before the United States Senate operating as nonprofits and yet asking Congress to be given an antitrust exemption. That's legit. As nonprofits. That's totally legit. And what happened is, you know, I, I was always against paying players uh, when I was a college student. I saw how well the Michigan State student athletes were treated. They were treated a lot better than us as students, and they should be. They're worth a lot more. A lot of that, uh, my position on that changed, though. 10 years ago when the new TV contracts came in with the conference realignment, because now we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the gross domestic products of Latin American countries are what we're making now. And you just cannot make the case that the cost, even with the cost of attendance, that scholarship for an athlete, that's a major contributor in football and to a lesser degree basketball, that, that, that he, that's even close to an equitable arrangement. It is not. And that's what you're referring to is over the last 10 years. Now it's been 10 years since those, since that summer of realignment, that they've had a decade. Over that decade, they could have made some concessions at the administrative level. They could have done the NIL a decade ago. They could have said, hey, if you want to major in football the way a violinist can major in music, cool. You got you know, to take some, you know, we have a, a general requirements for a degree, but if you want your major to be football, you learn football coaching, football administration, football officiating, whatever that is. Fine. Cool. They could have done things like this. They didn't. And then a pan they, they thought they were going to be able to just capitalize on other people's talent without compensating them what the market says they are worth, really into perpetuity. And then coronavirus hit, and suddenly the natural laws of economics kick in. And that's not the case. You don't get away with doing that. And that's why the players aren't organized, don't have a waiver. Uh, the things that have allowed pro sports to go on, we don't have here. And that's why we're here. And that's why the players threatening to go there, I think, is also why the Big Ten and Pac-12 were the first two conferences to pull the plug. When this is over, on the other end, the players are absolutely going to be organized. And it is going to be a brand new day. Who knows whether it'll be a better day, but it's certainly going to be different. We're going to get into a lot more of that on next week's episode right here on Bigger 10. Don't forget, 
uh, to give us a like, rate, subscribe. If it's on the podcast you're listening to us, give us a five-star review. If you give us a like, a subscribe, and a share here on YouTube, we would appreciate that. Uh, for Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. Don't forget to follow us as, uh, all week long uh, on Bigger 10, at Bigger 10, on Twitter as well. And we'll see you next time right here on Bigger 10. Bigger 10.